great opportunity for that. And it is good to be back. It's been a while, and uh, so I don't know if I'll figure this out. So I might need some help preaching today. So I need an amen corner. Will you guys serve as that? Amen. Encourage me along, and uh, we'll see if it's like riding a bike. But it's been five weeks since I've preached, and uh, honestly, it's been a long season. This year, we celebrate 25 years being on staff here at Liberty, and so for, for decades, really, we haven't been able to take an extended break. And so I just want to say how grateful I am to our staff and this team and us, you as a church to allow us that opportunity. And uh, I don't know if you know this, but very few pastors who go into ministry retire from ministry. And somewhere along the journey, they give up, they walk away, they do something different. In fact, less than 10% of pastors who start ministry finish in ministry. And I just want you to know, I'm committed to the long haul. And as a result of that, I'm really trying to do my best to pace this out and to make sure that I'm handling it right, to spend time with my family. You know, this week, actually, Kristen and I, we celebrate 20 years being married this Wednesday. Yeah. She's done all the heavy lifting. Come on, congratulate Kristen for a job well done, putting up with me. <laughs> so it's just been a good time to reflect and, and uh, to rest and to get ready. And we're ready. I've never been more excited, to be honest. I told Kristen like three times, I was like, I'm so excited to preach. She's like, you've already told me that. I was like, I know, but I'm excited. And last night I was up all night long just waiting for it to come. And so... I'll do my best to stick to the notes, but I believe God wants to speak into our life today and uh, wants to do something special. Amen to that? And so while we were away, my son, Caleb, graduated high school this year. And so um, several months ago, we said, well, for graduation as a gift, we want to go on a family vacation and you get to pick, a, pick where we're going to go. And so, of course, because, you know, he's a he is addicted, literally, to surfing. He loves it. It's like his obsession and passion, and uh, which I'm very proud of. He's like, I want to go to Costa Rica. And so we've been to Costa Rica several times, and so we went to co- we we're going to plan to go to Costa Rica to surf. And, uh, and I was wanting to get, you know, back in surf shape. Honestly, I've had a couple knee injuries, so I've been working out for like a year to be able to learn how to pop back up and to figure it out. And uh, to, to be able to surf with my kids again. And it was amazing. I mean, they surf like six, seven hours every day. And I surf like two or three. And it was, <laughs> it was awesome being able to bring my sons and my nephew along. And so I brought a picture. Here's a picture of me surfing just to prove that I'm still able to do it. <laughs> Come on, are you impressed or what? Look at that. Really, I just wanted to see it on a big screen, see what that looked like. And the truth is, is 0.5 seconds after that photo, I wiped out. So they got it right at the moment. But we had an amazing time being in Costa Rica. And one of the things we like about it, and probably you do whenever you vacation, is disconnecting. You're not glued to your phone, can't get in touch with anybody. It's not easy, so it's just easy to disconnect. And so it was great. But here was the challenge. In our room, when we got back to our room, we turned on the television and... Of course, we're in Costa Rica, so every channel's in Spanish, and so we didn't understand any of it. And uh, there was only one channel that was in English, and it was CNN. (laughs) And so every night, every time we went into the room and we turned on the television, the only thing we could watch was all the crazy stuff that was happening in the world. And it was really trying to just pull us back into the vortex of the chaos and the crazy. And, you know, it reminds me, it's sort of the dilemma, probably we've all felt, for how to find peace and how to find rest. It's because you really can't never organize chaos out of your life. I mean, you can do your best. I imagine every one of us have planned a vacation or tried to take a day off. And it was right when you tried to take a day off or tried to take a vacation, that crisis that you didn't anticipate came up. Anybody ever had that experience? And it sort of robs the opportunity for rest, robs the opportunity for peace. And so that's our challenge to find peace is because the chaos is even always at surface level, even if we can avoid it. And and there it is, back to run and control our life all too often. 
For the next four weeks, I want to talk about peace. And when I've been praying about this is I want us to, yes, I want us to understand what the scripture has to say about it. And hopefully we can get some insight. But more than knowing what the scripture says about peace or how the scripture describes as peace, that anytime we read the scripture, it's not just for knowledge, for knowledge's sake, but so that we can experience what the Bible says we can experience, that we would actually possess peace. Not that we would understand it better, but that we would live more fully with it in our life, present in our situation. And here's the deal. I know in a crowd this size with as many people that are here, because I know many of you, uh, that there are many people here that have a lot of anxiety. People that are stressed out and, and worried. There's a number of serious issues that many people in this room have been dealing with. And I'm sure there's several that haven't been able to sleep like they want to or keep themselves up up at night worrying about what's going to happen with your kids. They're going crazy again. Your spouse doesn't seem like they're committed like they used to be. Or maybe a vice and addiction that you just seem to can't get past no matter how much you want to. Maybe you got stuff going on at work. If nothing else, you've probably been to the grocery store and that is stress inducing right now, would you agree? I mean, I went to Subway the other day and it was like 14 bucks for a sandwich, I couldn't believe it. So it's understandable if you have anxiety, if you're dealing with stress, and not just the personal stuff that we're dealing with now, think about the macro issues in our world. The world is crazy, like, The world is at war. I mean, literally, people are like, we're on the edge of World War III. You got war in Russia, in the Ukraine, in the Middle East. Rumors of war in other places. I mean, if you just paid attention to what's happening in the world, not only that, but you got moral chaos in our world where the values that we have is really to do what's right in your own eyes. And as a result, there's chaos and it doesn't even know what to do. And when you got a world that values moral relativism rather than absolute truth, then all options are on the table. You just do whatever comes natural to you and basically put yourself and your feelings on the throne. And chaos ensues. And then, of course, you got politics. I mean, it's like a heavy political season, probably more divided politically than it's ever been. And demands that are being placed and fear that's being felt and the repercussions and the consequences of this person being elected and that person being elected. And what do you do with friends and family members that disagree with your political positions? You got infighting and issues. There is chaos in the world. So how do you find peace? Well, I think it's important for us to see what the scripture teaches and what I want us to revisit maybe because this isn't an issue we haven't addressed, but it's important to understand that peace, according to the Bible and according to Jesus, that peace and chaos can coexist. And what I mean by that is you don't have to have everything ideal in your life or in the world in order to experience peace. That if our idea of finding peace is finally everything working out just like it's supposed to work, then peace is always going to be elusive. Jesus offers us something more powerful related to his invitation to peace. John 16, 33, Jesus' words, he says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Everybody say, in me. I've told you these things so that in me, you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, come on somebody. I've overcome the world. Jesus doesn't pull any punches. He just says, hey, world's gonna be tough. You're gonna experience some trouble in this life, but no matter what you experience, The chaos that comes as a result of living in our broken world, in the middle of that, you can still have peace. I love how the amplified version just amplifies this, helps us to understand it, to put our life situation into this promise that Jesus gives. The amplified says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have perfect peace. 
In this world, you'll have tribulation, you'll have distress and suffering, but be courageous, be confident, be undaunted, be filled with joy, for I have overcome the world and my conquest is accomplished and my victory is abiding. That's good news right there. Doesn't just say in the world you'll have trouble, meaning there'll be problems. No, it goes on to say you'll have tribulation it's going to be so difficult at times. You're going to have distress. What are we going to do? This is overwhelming. I don't know what is going to happen. You're going to have suffering. It's going to be painful. But you can take heart. You can be courageous. You can be undaunted. You can even be full of joy in the middle of tribulation, in the middle of suffering, in the middle of distress because... You know that what Christ has done in conquering death and conquering our sin and bringing us back to God, that he is in charge, that his victory had happened and it still abides to this day. That's the good news. Yeah, come on, somebody. So just a, a few things that I wanna start with in this series. The first thing about peace is that peace is not naivety. Peace is not naivety. And what I mean by that, maybe even some of you are like, well, if you have peace right now, you're just not paying attention to what's happening. Because if you're really paying attention, you'd be concerned just like I'm concerned. You'd be wrapped in knots just like I'm wrapped in knots. You're not paying attention to this? If you have peace, your head's in the sand and you're pretending and you're minimizing and that's oftentimes the response. But when Jesus says this, he says, I've told you these things. I clued you into what's happening, that you can be clued in exactly to what's happening and know what's going on specifically and its consequences, and you can still have peace. The peace the Bible describes doesn't mean to stick your head in the sand or living blissfully unaware. Jesus' invitation to experience peace is not to escape the distress, to escape the trials, to escape the persecution that's coming, but rather to face what's happening with confidence because you know who's behind the choices that you make in that conviction. You can face it. You don't have to deny reality. In fact, you can defy reality by something you believe that is bigger, stronger, and more capable than whatever bad news you see on the newspaper, whatever you see on the screen, or whatever you feel in your heart. Doesn't mean we deny it, it just means that you refuse to allow the circumstances in your life, the circumstances in your world to bully you in such a way that you begin to live outside of God's will. And can I just encourage you, fear is not a fruit of the Spirit. God has not called you. He has not called you to live in his will and be overwhelmed by anxiety and fear at the same time. And it's something that has to be addressed and considered. And when Jesus is saying this, you just go back in the text, he's actually cluing them in to what's hap gonna happen in the not so distant future. I've told you these things. What were these things? Well, he said, I know you've been living your life following me, but I just gotta let you know things are gonna change. Your future is gonna look radically different. I'm not gonna be with you anymore. I'm going to be killed. <laughs> and he says, and as a result of that, you're gonna experience suffering and persecution. You're gonna be scattered all over the place. This is not gonna be a good situation. But take heart. Whatever you feel, whatever you see, whatever you anticipate that's on the horizon because of what you're experiencing, don't allow it to forget something critically important. I'm in charge, I'm in control, and this world is still subject to what I do. Now he's saying that to them in advance of it happening, which is hard. We got a different perspective. We look back on Jesus' conquering victory. And that should help us to measure some of our feelings. Like a few weeks ago, I do what guys do. I turned on ESPN, and on ESPN, there was a football game that I'd already seen a year ago. 
and I rewatched it again. Has any guy ever done that out there? You watch something, you've already seen it. Like I know how it's gonna play out. And let me just say this, last year I mentioned this right before college football season. Like I'm not gonna talk about college football or my favorite team or your favorite team. We're not even gonna mention college football all season long. And you guys didn't even notice, but I didn't mention it one time all season last year. Come on, that deserves some applause, all right? I make the same commitment today after this statement right here. So I watched the Iron Bowl from last year, Iron Bowl, Alabama and Auburn. I'm an Alabama fan, forgive me. I'm trying not to be, I'm not like the obnoxious Alabama fans. <laughs> but I was watching the Iron Bowl. And if you remember last year, it came down to the very end and it didn't look like Alabama was gonna pull it off. They're fourth and long, I mean, fourth and a mile. Like the game's over. And I was in a hotel room because I was preaching at a church the next day. So I'm in my hotel room, freaking out, watching the football game by myself. And if you remember it, you know, it was fourth and a mile, but he, not only did he make a complete pass and get the first down, but he scored, Milrow scored a touchdown and the game was over. We won. And I'm telling you, everybody on that floor heard me screaming when that happened. I'm just letting you know. But when I watched that, same play two weeks ago, I didn't make any noise. I wasn't freaked out at all. Wasn't anxious about how it was gonna play out, why? I knew how it was gonna play out. That's the hindsight bias we get to live with to see what Christ has done. What he promised them was gonna happen, we get to live in its reality. And can I just encourage you, that should change our disposition. It would, should help us to alleviate the fears and the worries and the concern. God has a plan and he's implementing that plan and will use you and will use me and will use people we don't agree with or we don't even like. God is in charge of history. It's still in his hands. That victory is abiding. That gives me confidence no matter what I face. And this doesn't mean we deny reality because here's the deal, the world is crazy. There's a lot of bad stuff that's happening. There's a lot of concerning things that we need to be mindful of. Life is difficult. How, how, how many have discovered that life is just, sometimes doesn't have any good answers, it's just challenging. But whatever chaos we're experiencing, whether in our life or around us, all of it is at the mercy of the one who conquered it. Exhale. I can rest. It's not denying reality. When I was going through a very difficult time in my life, honestly struggling with a lot of depression, and anxiety, there was a scripture in Psalm 112 that was like an anchor for my soul because I was afraid and fearful and worried about what was gonna happen. In Psalm 112, it's not gonna be on the screen, but it says the righteous will never be shaken. Never. The righteous will never be shaken. They will be remembered forever. They will have no fear of bad news because their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Their hearts are secure. They will have no fear. When it says they'll, fear, they'll not fear bad news, it doesn't mean that they figured out a way to make sure they don't get bad news. Like if they pray the right way, go to the right church, they'll never have any bad things happen. No, it means that even though they receive bad news or things don't go like you wanted it to, it will not cause them to buckle and shake and their heart will remain secure because of what their confidence is in. And it's in the Lord, not in the situation. A lot of times the things we worry about, we worry about the things that will never happen. But can I encourage you that Learning how not to allow anxiety to control us is not convincing ourselves that bad things won't happen to us, but rather actually at times, and I don't wish bad things, so don't misunderstand. If you got a need, let's pray and believe for good things to happen. But Jesus emphatically stated, we live in a broken world with broken systems and broken people. We're gonna experience trouble. 
And it's naivety to think that somehow if I just have enough faith, then I'm going to not experience those things. Actually, there's been many times where the thing that I feared the most was the thing that I experienced. And whenever I experienced the things that I did not want to see happen, I had to decide what my anchor was gonna be in. Was it gonna be in this situation or was it gonna be in the one who conquered it all? Things are bad. Can I just say, things might even get worse. But that doesn't mean we don't get to live with peace. Peace is not naivety. Second, peace is possible. It's possible. You can have it. Be like, no, 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 I can't have it. I got stuff happening. No, no, you can have it. But here's the dilemma. I don't know if you guys have been enjoying the Olympics, but I've been enjoying watching it. And uh, I haven't checked, so this could be wrong. Maybe this is, you know, me being an American just coming out, but I'm pretty sure we lead in the medal count, okay? Okay, it's close. China's probably right there. We're, you know, it's just, but either way, we're really close. We're either one or two. I'm just letting you know that. I've been watching. I've seen that synchronized swimming. I'm like, how in the world do people swim like that upside down? <laughs> I mean, saw that guy shooting at a target. It looked like he was barely, he had his hand in his pocket. Boom. We seen the surfer that got off the surfboard point. I loved it. But can I also say that Americans get a gold medal in something else? Not only are we the best synchronized swimmers, but we also get gold medals in anxiety. It's, it's amazing to think about. I love our country. I love where we live. We live in the most affluent, country, not only in the world, but in the history of mankind, have access to opportunities, more things, more stuff to make it easy, and yet the United States is now the most anxious country in the world. Between 1997 and 2004, Americans have doubled their spending on anti-anxiety medications from 900 million to over 2 billion. And I'm sure it's way more than that. It's an old stat. Let me say it this way. Anxiety is as American as apple pie. It's just part of our DNA. In fact, immigrants who come and migrate into our country, they don't have the same stresses, but when they come here, they learn a different way of life and they assume a lot of our customs and one of them is increased anxiety. According to the National Institute of Mental Health, anxiety disorders are reaching epidemic proportions. 20% of Americans say they ha have had a panic attack on any given year. One in five. And let me just say, as someone that has, has had anxiety issues, I'm not looking down, I'm not minimizing, I'm just stating what it is. 20%. The American Medical Association cited a study that expressed that in exponential increases of depression, so much so that our generation is three times more likely to suffer depression than previous generation. Now, it might be that we have access to more things now, but I'm just saying, I don't know why this is, considering that our cars are safer, our water's safer, the air's safer, we have access to medical care. We live longer than any other per people group in the history of mankind, and yet we still have anxiety. In fact, what's so amazing, what's interesting is that citizens in developing countries experience anxiety levels less than Americans do. I mentioned almost 20% of Americans have experienced a panic attack in a given year. Do you know how many people in Mexico have, have had a panic attack in a year? 6%, right? I mean, a third less, and this isn't the pit. I'm just saying that maybe our stuff isn't working. In fact, the news gets worse, not to worry you or anything. <laughs> a UCLA, UCLA research team researched 200,000 incoming freshmen and discovered that young people are stressed out more than ever before. 
Students report all-time lows in overall, health, overall mental health and stability. Robert Leahy pointed out that the average high school kid today has the same anxiety level as the average psychiatric patient, patient from the 1950s. And it ain't because we're without. Maybe it's because we got too much. But we don't have peace. So let me just be clear, if you're struggling with anxiety, I'm not making light of it, I'm not diminishing it, I'm just saying it is, it, it is a reality in the world that we live in and normalized. And if you have a medical issue, those things need to be addressed medically, so I'm not suggesting anything different than that. But the Bible talks about anxiety and anxiety and fear are different. To be afraid of something, to have fear of something, sometimes is the most, is the, is the most wise thing you can do. Fear is what you feel when you're walking along a path and you see a rattlesnake coiled up next to that path. How many think you'd be afraid? And you should be, that's dangerous, that's scary, right? But anxiety is not seeing the rattlesnake, anxiety is being convinced there's a rattlesnake on every path, therefore you don't take any paths. It's an overwhelming sense of dread that may be real, may not be, but it doesn't matter because it controls you and it subdues you in many ways. It's something we need to be mindful of. And the way that you cope with anxiety usually is done in two different ways. One is apathy, meaning, okay, the world's crazy, my life's crazy, I should just not care. I'm gonna go with the flow and take it easy, you know? And that's kind of sweeping it under the rug. The other way of dealing with it, maybe for some of us, is how we deal with it, and that's by activism. There's a problem and something has to be done and I'm the one to do it. And if I could just make sure that this doesn't happen and that doesn't happen, then the peace would come back. And while, yes, we're supposed to do stuff and we're supposed to be peacemakers, people that actually make peace. But some of us were so wound tight with fear that we're driven towards activism to accomplish a goal, can I just tell you, is outside of your grasp, outside of my grasp. I mean, then we live in it. We're dominated by a 24-hour news cycle that just drums us up with panic and anxiety. I mean, just to go there, just to mention, you could turn on a news channel, and a specific news channel, you're gonna hear 24 hours, seven days a week of them trying to convince you that if Donald Trump becomes the president, it's the end of the world as we know it. Right? And then you flip the channel to another channel and they're gonna do the same thing 24 hours a day and convince you if, if Kamala Harris gets elected, then it's gonna be the end of the world as we know it. And I think we need to be informed and I think these issues matter, but can I just encourage you to remind you that oftentimes where we get information from, it's not simply to give us accurate information, but they actually have an agenda and they don't thrive by giving you accurate information. They thrive out of fear because fear generates ratings and ratings generates revenue. Let's just be mindful of what the messages that we're around to make sure that we're clued into what's really happening and it doesn't drag us away towards something else. Activism, or maybe a better way of saying it, here's what I do. Like when things are out of control, I try to take back control, right? I try to control it, I manage it out, adjust. I'll never go down that path because there's snakes down there. I've been in a relationship, relationships going south. I won't have relationships like that anymore. We'll be better planned, better executed next time to alleviate all the anxiety and the chaos out. But of course, the irony of this is when, let me just ask you, does anybody know any control freaks? Let me see your hand. Would you be honest? Do you know any of them? Okay, how many are those people, all right? all right? It's always less. Everybody knows one. The irony is that people like myself who try to control things to make sure that they have peace are the most anxious people. It doesn't work. In fact, can I just challenge, I mean, we live in crazy times and the Bible says it might get worse. I mean, it does. I mean, Jesus just said, hey, here's what is gonna happen in the end times. And I don't know if, what you believe about all that, but certainly would point to a lot of that. 
Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 24 says, in the end times, you're going to have earthquakes, you're going to have famine, you're going to have deception, you're going to have false religions, you're going to have war, you're going to have persecution. That's what Jesus is saying. This is what's coming. But here's what he says in verse 6, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. He's saying, make sure in those times when you hear of the famines, the earthquakes, the chaos that's around us, our job is to not be troubled by them because we know who's in charge of all the stuff that's happening. We can have peace. Peace isn't removing bad situations. Peace, biblical peace, is a state of mind that allows us to stand firm in any situation. Lastly, Peace is not accidental. It's not naivety, it's possible, but it's not accidental. It doesn't come because you want it, because you wish it. Peace doesn't come by chance, it comes by choice. But you gotta make a choice about it. You gotta make a decision. Here's where we're gonna anchor ourselves in the next three weeks. It's Philippians chapter four, verse four through nine. And this is Paul's prescription, if you will, an antidote, a cure for worry. And let me just, before you just say, wow, he's lived such a charmed life, it must be nice to be able to say that. Can I remind you that Paul was flogged, beaten, shipwrecked, stoned, left for half dead, uh, had his clothes removed, was robbed of everything that he could so that he could preach the gospel, lived under, under a, an extremely oppressive and maniacal government. And he's writing this from jail, from being mistreated by that government. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all people. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and pleading with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence in anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And as for the things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. He doesn't say understand it, know it. He says, no, put it to work, put it to practice, and the God of peace will be with you. The secret to all this is three words, in the Lord. In the Lord. This is our posture when we face crisis and chaos, when we see it abound and we're afraid, we remind ourselves that our confidence is in the Lord. And when Paul uses this, rejoice in the Lord, the Lord is near. He's saying the reason I can rejoice is because I know the master, I know the king, I know the one who is in charge and in control, and therefore I can have even a defiant joy, a defiant rejoicing in the face of the chaos that I see around me and the chaos that I feel here. And if you're rejoicing and your peace is not in the Lord, can I just tell you, it is temporary. It is temporary. It is not going to last. It's gonna, it's gonna be there when everything's doing just fine, when the kids are behaving, when your wife does what you want, the, want her to do, when your job is taking care of all of your needs, that's when peace is gonna be found. But Jesus says you can have everything stripped away from you. You could live in a world of distress and tribulation and even pain and suffering and in the middle you have a peace that passes understanding. Paul's solution to a crazy world is you need a crazier peace. A peace that doesn't make sense. A peace that isn't there because the bills are paid. 
a peace because you know and you have the courageous faith to be undaunted because you know the one who is in charge of it all. Can I just encourage you, this doesn't generate apathy. Some of you are like, we got an email right now because if you tell people that God's in charge, they won't vote, they won't do this, they won't be, you know, I'm not saying. But our posture as his followers is one of confident trust in the sovereignty of God and the power of God to sort out his will and plan in the world and in my life. And whenever I do that, peace is a promise that I get to now live with. Let's bow our heads if we can. I don't know where you're at today, but if you're here and you say, I've just been dealing with some anxiety, maybe some stress, and you want some prayer, I just wanna pray with you. Would you slip your hand up and say, I've just been dealing with some stress, man. I'm anxious. Yeah, lots of you. Right now, I pray peace in Jesus' name, that it would be a guard in their hearts and their minds. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be mindful of your power and your plan and your provision in our life when things get wild and crazy and you would give us the courage to focus our energy and our mind on your power and strength, not on ours. Where we could experience rest in the middle of it, Lord. We do believe, God, that you would sort out our lives in such a way that you would be honored and that we could follow you, but God, more than ideal situations, Lord, I pray that you would help us to see you in your rightful place. Others of you don't have a relationship with God. And if you don't trust Christ, if you haven't had your, the experience like Lola where you've committed and submitted your life to Jesus, not only as the savior of your sin and your life because you've wandered away from God, but also the Lord of your life, peace is gonna come with your moods and gonna come with your preferred candidate. It's gonna come when you get a raise. It's gonna come when the person returns their love to you, but it's gonna be gone when that turns away. But if you need the peace of God that comes with knowing you're a son, you're, you're taken care of, you're safe in his arms. If that's you and you need to say yes to Jesus, you need to trust him with your life, today is your day. And I compel you not to leave this place before you do business with God and you trust him today. Or if you've wandered away from him and he's not your trust and you wanna return and give him your trust, I want you to respond as well. In just a moment, I'm gonna pray a prayer. If you want to be included in that prayer, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you forward just right where you're at. If that's you and you need to say yes to Jesus, would you slip your hand up without hesitation? That's me. I need to say yes to him. Yes. Yes. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. I see you over here. I see you up there. Yes. Thank you, Lord. Anybody else? Real quick. Wow. Awesome. If you're online, you can press raise my hand. God will meet you right where you're at. Come on, church, let's all pray this prayer together. Believe it from your heart. Say, God in heaven, I've kept you out of my life for too long. And today I invite you in. Forgive me of my sin. Make me new. I believe in your victory, Jesus, that you died and rose again. Today I make you my Savior and my Lord. I'll follow you for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. We're gonna celebrate you in just a minute.